Um, so uh, as you can see, I've got my uh, very high tech slides uh, today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, program synthesis. So I sort of picked this title, um, Secrets of Type Driven Program Synthesis, which is kind of a bit silly. They're not secrets. They're, in fact, if you went to um, and if you went to Nadia Polyakhopova's talk yesterday, you'll have found out quite a bit of um, the kinds of things that I'm going to talk about. So what I'm going to talk about here is the, the Idris dependent type spin on what program synthesis is all about. So uh, what it can do, why it's useful, how I use it, and crucially, how it works. Because I think um, if you're if you're doing type driven development in a in a language like Idris, or you know you can do this in uh, you can use a lot of the principles in in lots of uh, related programming languages. Um, you should be getting a lot more benefit from giving giving your programs type up front. And I want you to go away from this talk not only knowing um, the sorts of things that Idris can do, also having some idea of how it can work. And if you're if, if you're working on uh, other programming languages, I'm, I'm sure plenty of you are in, in various forms, one way or another. Maybe finding ways to get some of these tricks in, into your own uh, favorite languages. I just notice this isn't quite centered and it's bothering me. There you go. That's better. <laughs> so you can you can edit slides on the fly this way. It's great. Uh, right. So I'm going to start with um, with a few um, a few introductory examples. So you you might have seen some of these before. Uh, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page here and give you an idea of what um, what the machine is doing. So I'm going to talk about program synthesis. I'm going to talk about how it works. But thinking back to when I was uh, a graduate student and my my advisor. Um, uh, James McKinna, whenever I was struggling with something, like if I couldn't understand a program or I couldn't get a program to work or I couldn't make a mechanical proof go through, um, he would encourage me to be the machine, like understand what the machine was doing. If you understand what the machine is doing, then you have half a chance of being able to um, interact properly with the machine. And in the end, this is what programming is about. It's, 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 it's what we're doing when we're programming. We are, we are interacting with a machine. We're like having a conversation with a machine. I like to think of programming being like a conversation with the machine. So we will initiate the conversation by saying to the machine as our assistant, hey, this is the program we're going to work on. Uh, can you help me with it? I'll just do that for one program, um, hopefully a program you've seen before. So it, it's a program that it, it takes a number and something, some type variable, uh, an element of some type, and it gives us a list of those things. Um, and that's all, that's all we know for now. You can probably infer from the name what this is going to do. Um, so the process in Idris is it's an interactive one. We, um, giving the type up front means we can ask uh, the language questions. So I can go to the, the Idris menu here. I'm using Vim, but this works in, um, this works in, uh, um, in, in other editors. So I'm going to add uh, an introductory clause, the first clause. And it says, uh, it gives me a candidate definition. And this thing on the right-hand side, this is a hole. If you program in Haskell, you, um, you'll certainly have seen these. A hole stands for a bit of a program that isn't written yet. We can ask the machine uh, what we need to do to fill in that hole. So the first question we, we might ask, us, ask ourselves here is, do I already have enough information to fill in this hole? So what's it telling us? It's telling us we have um, an X of some type, we have a number, and we need a list. Actually, we do have enough information to fill in this hole. Um, I can fill it in with an empty list, and we might say we're done. But it's kind of unsatisfying, isn't it? This is this is probably not what we meant. There is a clue that this is probably not what we meant, which is that we haven't used either k or x. We've used neither of the arguments. So I'm just going to undo that. And I'm going to think about how might we write this program using those arguments. So. Maybe a natural thing to do, I won't go through the full thinking here, but a natural thing to do is case split on, on the number because actually we can't case split on anything else. So if we're having no repetitions, we'll have the empty list. If we're having successor of k repetitions, so this is just one plus k, this is standing for one plus k, then that means we have an x and then some more stuff. So always a good idea to check the type of a hole to see where you're going. See, we need another list. Ideally, I'll, I'll skip a step or two. You know, we could pick the empty list, but we we do want to use the arguments again. We do. We, right, we still haven't used. Um, we still haven't actually uh, uh, used all the arguments fully. So um, what we're going to do is is do k repetitions of x, and that's the program. So I've gone through a few steps here, kind of um, 
without really thinking that this is a program about making a number of rep a number of copies of an element, I've just looked at the type and I've applied this this heuristic of maybe we should use the arguments, uh, and I've come out with a program. So. I'm kind of going to invert the be the machine thing that my my, my supervisor kept uh, bashing into me. Uh, what I did uh, this is last summer. Um, I sort of realised that I was I was um, I was writing programs the same way a lot of the time, and rather than me being the machine, I thought it was time to teach the machine to be me. So we now have uh, an option. Oops, we now have an option. Um, which is generate definition, which essentially follows those steps that I've just um, I've just gone through. So the rest of this talk, I just realized I didn't start my timer. Um, I don't know how to. Do. There we go. Um, so the rest of this talk is about why that's useful, what's going on behind the scenes, how can you use it. Now. I'll just do a couple of examples just to, before I before I launch into the the details of, of how things are working. Um, and oh, one thing you uh, one thing you'll notice when I hit generate definition. So I'm going to hit generate definition for append. Uh, one thing I should draw attention to is there's this there's this very slight pause between me clicking generate definition and the generation uh, the the definition coming out. That is. Um, this uh, I, I have no way of making you believe this. I'm just going to assert this, and that 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 is almost entirely the startup time of the Idris process. So Idris two is, is Idris two is now implemented in itself, which is pretty cool. Um, it compiles via Shea Scheme. So Shea Scheme is uh, an implementation of the Scheme programming language that uh, Kent Dibvig initially wrote and it got picked up by Cisco. It's had decades of engineering um, put into it. It's really, really fast. Um, it's. I was really surprised how how fast uh, um, um, uh, how fast the generated code was. It's kind of hard to compare that with other things. But let's just say it's um, <laughs> it's fast enough, and it's faster than I expected. Um, unfortunately, it has a short startup time, and whenever I hit the generate definition, it has to start up the address process. Um, so, so when you're seeing these pauses, it's not because it's taking it a lot of time to find an answer. It's um, it's just that it's starting up scheme. So the sort of situation where you might use this, and th this is where, so if you were at Nadia's talk, uh, and if you've seen other work on uh, type-driven program synthesis, I think I think we have a slight difference in philosophy for, for what this is for. I see program synthesis as being uh, a way of helping me to get from my idea to the final program. It's kind of like if you're programming in uh, the more mainstream language with a fancy IDE, and you type x dot, and x is at one of your local variables, and you get a list of completions. Um, it's kind of like that, but then cranked up a bit uh, further, so taken, uh, taken a lot further. Um, it's so it's it's when you have a bit of the program, it's like you know what it's going to be. It's I don't want to use the word obvious, but it's um, uh, there's 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 a few mechanical steps to get to your program, but it's 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 boring to figure out what they are. That's what this is for. So it's for taking the, the pain out of writing some of the boring bits of your program. It's So it's good for things like um, your basic plumbing. So uncurry is an example. It's a, it, maybe you, you have a function of two arguments and you need a function that takes a pair. So I'll generate the definition for that one. Um, so one thing to note here, you, you won't necessarily like the first definition that comes out. and um, the search space of valid programs, even if restricted by type, and even if restricted by a fairly precise type, the search space is quite big. Um, and there might be lots of correct programs. There might they might even be equivalent programs, but you just might not like the way they look. So um, there is a, a, a do it again button. I don't I don't have it in the menus yet. So it's sort of like repeatedly hit it with a hammer until it changes into the the thing you want. So let, let's I don't actually like this because I'd actually like to pattern match on X. So let's hit that with a hammer, and I, I think that's a bit uh, I think that's a bit prettier. Um, I'll just do a couple more just to just to show you the tubes. That <laughs> that doesn't prove anything because I pressed the wrong button. Uh, so the, the 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 things you would expect to work, um, which are your basic plumbing. 
they come out okay. Now, um, you know how to write these programs if you're if you've got a bit of experience in <clears throat> uh, in function uh, in functional programming. Nevertheless, it, it's still nice to have that facility. Where things get a bit more useful uh, and um, kind of, of, of more practical benefit is when you start um, writing uh, more precise dependent types. So I've got an example here of um, the type of heterogeneous lists. So um, uh, you could sort of think of these as like extensible record types. So a heterogeneous list is one where the type of the list tells us what the individual elements of the list types are. So you could say, um, let's, let's do uh, something like that. And then that would mean that uh, our elements have to be uh, a character and a string. Let's just check that that's correct. Good. <clears throat> um, so yeah, it's so it's a way of a way of uh, having lists that are well typed, but nevertheless each element is a different type. But when I look things up in that list, I, I really have to know the type of the element I'm looking for, because um, you know if you if you have some kind of it's sort of like what you could do in a dynamically typed language by having different elements at different points in the list. But if you're doing that, it's probably because you had some intention of interpreting the different elements at different positions in the list in different ways. So we have to have some way of explaining what type we're expecting at each position in the list. So this LM at type, it's a predicate that says at the nth position in the list, I expect uh, this type. So uh, when we're looking up the i th thing in the list of um, these types, uh, this will be the type that we get out. So when we look up something at uh, a position in the list described by a, a position i in the list, we know what its type is supposed to be. So we look it up in the list and we get out that type. But if you look at the definition of ln at, um, we've kind of already written the lookup function. We've, we've in the type here. We've explained what it means to be at a particular position in the list. So, at, at position zero in the list, the the type of the element is going to be t. If 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 the list is of the form t cons t's, then the thing at that position is going to be a t. And if I know that the thing at position k has type t, then I know that the position uh, at the, the the element of position k plus one in a list with one more thing is also going to be t. So I've, I've written the relevant bits of the, the lookup function here. And I haven't given a case for the empty list because locking things up in the empty list um, doesn't work. So I've already written the program. Why should I have to write it again? Um, the good news is I don't. So I asked the machine uh, to say, well, I've done it. Just in further, just figure out the details for me. Again, that's a little bit contrived, not something you have to do very often. So I want to show you a real example that um, <laughs> I didn't actually do, because, um, but I, I would do now. And this real example comes out of Idris itself. So as I say, Idris, uh, Idris 2 is implemented in Idris 2. Um, and I've tried to take full advantage of the fact that we have dependent types to rule out um, some possible implementation errors. Um, so I don't want to go into the, the, the full details of that right now because um, <laughs> there's a lot of them. Um, but um, the, the, the relevant one here is that when we represent expressions in the language, so we have a, we have a syntax tree that, that describes um, valid programs in the language. And because uh, Getting getting variable names right is hard, and, and doing manipulations on variable names is hard. We uh, index terms by the names in scope. So uh, internal to the system, there's there's a type of variable names, and there's a type of uh, well typed terms which is indexed by the names in scope. So um, if I add a new variable, so say with a let binding or a, or a lambda binding, then this list of names will get bigger. Uh, and the way we refer to variables is by index, by by counting along in that list. So this this has so it's a De Brown index. If you've if you've seen this um, uh, this way of representing programs before, um, so um, so most of the details of that not so important here. 
but the type system really helps us um, get things right where th this kind of manipulation of, of variable names can get tricky um, as you add more and more variables and as you do evaluation of programs. So we do need to um, write a few helper functions on these lists of names in order to be able to um, uh, write our programs. So, so there's various bits of manipulation on these names I have to do. And that involves uh, often doing a little bit of theorem proving to say that uh, one scope is bigger or smaller than the other. So this, this type of subvars comes up quite a bit. Um, so if, if you were just at uh, Philip Wadler's talk, you'll have, you'll have seen some of the things that, uh, that lead up to this. So thinking about representations of programming languages and doing proofs of things. Um, so um, we are saying that this list, um, this first list is um, a smaller list than the second list. So we're either going to keep elements from the second list or we're going to drop them. So, uh, so the list X's is the same as itself. We haven't dropped anything. So that's a, a re reflexivity. Um, if X's is a sublist of Y's, then we can drop something. So we can th then, then by dropping the first thing in Y's, we're saying that X's is a sublist of Y cons Y's. And then if X's is a sublist of Y's and we keep the first thing, then x cons x's is going to be a sublist of x cons y's. And uh, th this is the sort of thing we would uh, say when, when, when doing these, solving these unification problems or when, when working in smaller scopes, we need to do these manipulations on terms. So uh, what might I want to do? I might want to say that, um, well, I know if I know that x's is a sublist of y's, then I want to add a load of variables. So I want to run these two programs, these two sub expressions in a, in a bigger scope and I want to grow the scope the same way. Uh, I had to write this, these things by hand because when I was writing these, uh, Idris 2 hadn't been implemented yet. Uh, now, I just thought I, I try this as an experiment to, to see if they would, they would come out as, um, as I'd written them. So if I hit the generate button, then it's done. This is it, it. It will. It will. It will just keep adding the. Um, so it'll keep adding constructors until we get to the end of the list ends. So that's good. And that, as it happens, that is the implementation I had. Um, another one, uh, slightly trickier, is, is the other way around. If I, if I want to add the the variables on the end of the list, and again, I've needed this in various places inside the system. I'm going to try generating that one, and um, takes us touch longer. I don't actually like this thing it's generated. Um, it's too complicated. Um, and I'm just going to hit it with the hammer again. Um, and uh, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that one. It's, um, it's a bit shorter. Um, and uh, it's, it, I, can, I can look at that, and I can reload it and check that it's, uh, it's valid. And as it happens, this second one it's found is the one that uh, that Idris uses. So uh, I use that one just to show that I, I give you these contrived examples. And um, why do I pick these contrived examples? Well, I pick them because they work, don't I? Um, but this is something that um, if you're doing if you're doing some fairly sophisticated type level manipulation, or actually, it's not even that sophisticated. If you're doing some um, type level manipulations of lists, it's nice to have something that will just generate these fairly mechanical structural proofs for you. So that's uh, that's a few examples. And um, sometimes when I when I show this to people, they say, uh, you know, either it's just a magic trick or wow, that looks like magic. It really depends how impressed you are, I suppose. Um, so I suppose it is just a magic trick. Um, and the thing about magic tricks, conjuring tricks, is that they're, they're, they generally rely on, on a really simple principle uh, that you don't have to think about. Or you know, when you're observing the trick, you don't know that really simple principle. And uh, I'm just going to say here, there is no magic. There's no um, th there's no kind of machine learning, or there's no there's there's well there's a there's a simple heuristic involved, but there's there's no there's no kind of um, heuristics plucked out of thin air just because they appear to work. There is an algorithm here. So I said there were no slides. I have actually got slides. Uh, this is uh, so I'm going to spend the next uh, I don't know ten minutes or so, um, just or maybe a bit longer, um, explaining. Uh, some of the details about how this works internally. 
and to get across that there's no magic and you can implement this yourself if you if you happen to be implementing um, a, a programming language with types. You don't even need dependent types uh, for this to be really useful. And if you remember the, the, that first example I showed you with repetition, um, no dependent types there, you still get the definition out that, um, uh, that you would have wanted. So um, there's no magic, there is an algorithm. Um, and when I say algorithm, I'm using algorithm in the sense that it, that it was originally intended, not in the sense that, uh, that, you, might, um, uh, that, that you might find in the, media, uh, the, the popular media, the popular press. I'm using algorithm to mean something that you can explain and you can work through by hand and you will get the same answer. So you know, I started off with the be the machine, I'm gonna teach the machine to be me. Well, now that I've taught the machine to be me, you can learn to be the machine. You can follow this algorithm. You can see exactly what it's doing. So essentially, what's happening is we've got a we've got a few um, a few primitives inside the the Idris system that um, yeah. When I've talked, about, I've been talking about Idris for goodness knows how long now, uh, and I've always done these um, incremental. Um, I've always done incremental programming, step by step. Show you the whole. Do a case split. Refine it a bit see what holes have come out, refine it a bit more, get to the answer. Essentially, it's the, the type define refine. It's the, um, the, the, the three word <laughs> mantra of type driven development. Um, so, you've, we, so we've got those primitives and essentially the idea is to put those primitives together, um, program those primitives or explain to the machine how to apply those primitives itself. So the basic idea is a type driven search um, we'll build the programs in incrementally. We'll only explore well-typed paths. Um, so the, uh, again, I'm going to refer back to, if you've seen uh, Nadia talk about this, um, there's a huge space of um, possible programs. We only look at the, the ones that, that might be relevant to the type we're currently looking for. Just as an aside, by the way, I, um, I, uh, I sometimes I sometimes read things on the internet that uh, which is you know, bad stuff. Uh, but I sometimes read things on the internet that people have written about Idris. I read people's opinions about um, programming languages, and one that often a criticism that often comes across is, um, unlike Haskell and other languages, Idris doesn't have type inference. You need to put the type up front, and that's kind of a big deal. So, my response to that uh, is well, firstly. Idris does do loads of type inference. It's only the top level type you have to give. There's, there's type inference happening throughout. And secondly, yes, it is kind of a big deal. It's, it's sort of weird to, um, to me at least, to write a program and then say to the machine, okay, this is what we're gonna do. Can you tell me what the plan was? So I think of the type as a plan. Um, and, and it's like, <laughs> I did a thing, I wonder what it was I was trying to do. That's, that's kind of what type inference is to me at the top level. Um, but it's also a big deal because uh, there is a payoff for, for giving the types up front. So they're always thinking ahead about what the program is going to do. And it's exactly this. It's exactly type-driven program synthesis. So I think it's time now. And it's, it's great that there's loads of people working on this in all sorts of different systems. And working on it for all different uh, different uh, um, kinds of purpose, all kinds of different uh, purposes. We're now starting to see the payoff of of saying of, of you know deciding that type inference is not um, uh, the most important thing to have in a language. We are starting to get the benefits, and I think we need to work uh, harder to get more of those benefits. Anyway, enough of that aside. So. Um, Build programs incrementally, only explore well-tied paths. Multiple results are possible. As we've seen just a couple of examples, we've seen a, a couple of cases where um, it, th there are possibly multiple results. So the first one was with repetition, where the, the first result is just, well, it's the empty list. Um, so why didn't we get that when I asked for it, uh, when I asked for it to generate a definition? Uh, the reason is the results are ordered with <clears throat> a surprisingly simple heuristic. Uh, I've used two words here that I really shouldn't use, uh, surprisingly and simple. Um, both of those words are, are up to you as an audience to decide whether you agree with them. Uh, I was surprised, that's why I've used the word surprisingly. Um, <clears throat> and then I'll leave it to you to decide whether it's simple. Um, so, uh, oops, why is that not working? There we are. Um, so we do need some, um, uh, primitive operations. 
So we need holes. Uh, we need case splitting. You've seen these two things. Um, and we're going to need uh, unification. So unification, again, this is a, this is a huge topic um, to, to, to explore. But you can understand unification for the purpose of this talk is taking two um, two expressions and seeing if they are the same expression if you fill in some of the holes. So it, it comes up with some solutions for the holes to make two expressions the same. Uh, maybe this is a good, I should probably have done this already, but this is probably a good point to ask if uh, anyone has uh, anything they want to ask before I launch into some of the details in a worked example. Um, it, it would also be reassuring to hear somebody's voice, to be honest. <laughs> We have a number of questions which were posted already. Uh, if anyone would like to join Edwin now and yeah. ask a question, just raise your hand, please. We have John who will be joining us now. Hello, Edwin. Hi, John. Well, I had a, a couple of questions. Um, so one of them is, it's very nice that Idris writes this code for you, but when you read the code, you still have to read it. You don't know that this was generated in this way. Might it oh. nice to have a visible indication that this is just the obvious code? You don't need to read it. Yeah, that's that's a good question. I don't I don't actually know what that should look like, but I think I agree that it should look like something. <laughs> um, it's um, like sometimes it might be that you want you, you say generate this code every time, and I never want to see it. <clears throat> But a lot of the time, it's generate this code, and then I'm going to look at it and see if I agree with it. So, um, so I haven't said this yet, but something I often say is um, none of this synthesis generation frees you from understanding what the code is supposed to do. Um, so the fact that it's just because it's obvious doesn't mean you should leave it out. But you might want to collapse it somehow. And that, that's maybe a, an interactive editor question that, that I don't really know the answer to. It's a, it's sort of, it's a user experience question that we need to start thinking more about. So yeah, interesting question. And I'm afraid I don't know the answer. <laughs> but I'll think okay. about it. I'll think about it some more. I had another question as well, which was, <laughs> um, if we go, if we think of your lookup example, yeah. then um, you gave the type of lookup, and then you said, well, this type really tells us what the function should do. Here's the code. But yeah. actually, the code was quite short and sweet. Yeah. And that type you defined, you only defined it in order to be able to write that code. Sure. So might you perhaps use synthesis the other way around sometimes yeah. to write Absolutely. the obvious code and synthesize the type? Can you do that? I, well, you can't at the minute, but um, but again, that's a great idea. And it's um, it's actually something that um, when I uh, when I talk to James McKinner about this, it's something that he uh, he talks about a bit. So it talk he, it's it's actually a technique I learned from him. I don't know goodness knows how long ago, uh, of, of looking at a function and then calculating what the, the predicate should be by looking at the function. Mm. Um, so we are um, we, we, we have a, a reflection mechanism. It's in its infancy at the minute. Um, but the reflection mechanism has the ability to look at the definitions of things and potentially generate data types. So like maybe you would write just your regular Boolean function and maybe the data type generation would know what the true and false meant, and it would know to generate the constructors for true and not for false. Um, I have wanted this sort of thing, so so I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm glad that someone watching this has said I want that too. Um, we should we should look at that. I mean, I think we're now. I, um, I think I mentioned we, we had the uh, the dependent types panel a couple of me a weeks ago. I think this is a, a thing I mentioned that um, we're now at a point in in uh, the exploration of dependently typed programming, where I think the most important thing to do is not look at fancy language stuff, but look at how to interact with it and, and think about how we can how we can automate some of these techniques that we've all painstakingly learned over the last uh, decade or so. So I'd love to hear more of these ideas because we, in fact, even better, um, I'm, I'm thinking out loud now, sorry. Um, even better would be if the reflection mechanism would allow you as the programmer to write your own methods of interaction uh, with the system. So we've given a little bit of thought to that. I'm not sure exactly how it would work. 
Um, and there was a paper a couple of years ago by uh, Jimmy Corcutt where he talked about extensible type-driven editing. So I, I think that this space of uh, interactive programming and programming of the conversation is is something that we should explore. It's it's there's loads of interesting ideas there, and there's loads of ways of improving our interaction with a programming language there. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Um, I should probably move on unless there's any burning questions that people want to ask. Okay, let's. Um, uh, I'll leave time at the end. Um, so um, yeah, what I what I wanted to do it's something I never really get around to doing because I, I I have this as you've just experienced I have this terrible tendency in in these talks of um, having an idea pop into my head and then I start thinking about it but um, um, I know horrible thinking about things. Um, let's talk a little bit about how it works. Um, I've, um, I've I've sent these slides to Barbara, so so these slides will be online. Um, I really I, I mostly wrote this slide uh, as as something you could browse afterwards, uh, rather than something that you need to to follow now. Uh, I just want to give a, a flavour of of how the search works. So um, we start by so you've seen holes. Holes have context. They have target types. So the context of the whole contains a number of local variables. So the first thing expression search will do is it will look at the local variables and it will say, do any of these work? And if they do, we've won. Slight refinement um, is that it, it can say, well, any, are any of these pairs, can I use first and second to project elements from the pairs? That's, that turns out to be such a, such a useful refinement that we've just done that. So if that didn't work, we say, is it a function type? If it's a function type, um, introduce a lambda and move on. If it's a data type, so if it's a list, for example, go through all the constructors, try solving, try solving the expression with every one of the constructors applied to some arguments which are new holes. So we can introduce new holes whenever we like. Um, so we just in, in, invent some new holes. Um, solve the solve the thing we're searching for with the constructor applied to those holes, unify it with the type we're looking for, see what comes out. So that unification, with any luck, unifying the solution with the target type will say, yes, and I solve some of the holes, and then we'll see what holes are left over. So that might fail, in which case we move on to the next constructor. And then if all of that fails, um, we try a recursive call. So um, we know when we're doing when we're when we're searching for um, uh, the results or the, the, uh, an implementation of an expression. We know the type we're looking for. We know what the left hand side of the definition was. So we know um, uh, we know what it means to make a, a, a recursive call with a descending argument. And there's lots of choices we could make for that descending argument. So there's maybe a few possibilities here. Um, <clears throat> but it's the final step. If all else fails. Try solving with a recursive call. I'm going to work through an example. I'm going to I'm going to be the machine, and I'm going to do it with our old friend, the vectors. We've actually got like half an hour, 35 minutes into a dependent types talk, and I haven't said the word vector yet. And uh, in case the dependent types police get me, I'm, I'm going to do it now. Um, the <laughs> the reason we talk about vectors, just for those of you who are groaning, uh, I do this exactly because you've seen it before. So that's um, so. Uh, Imagine we've got um, we're, we're in a situation where we're searching for the final um, uh, the final part of, of append, which is the, the recursive case for. Uh, so we've we've got uh, we've got our x cons x's and y's. We're trying to append them. How do we fill that in? Uh, so vectors can either be empty or they can be non-empty. If they're non-empty, then the length of the vector, the index of the vector, will say that it's non-empty. So we will. Um, the, the type here is vector of successor of something. So remember, step one: look at the local variables. Do any of these work? So none of these work. I'll, uh, I'm just going to try to. And the way I find out whether it works is I use unification. So. Um, so does a unify with this lot? No. Does vector k a unify? No. And so on. Um, so we could also, at this point, we could look to see if we could project any pairs out. We could look at look and see if we apply any of these as arguments, so we, uh, apply any of these as functions. So if any of these has function types, then we apply them. None of that works in this case. So we move on to the constructors of vect. Um, nil doesn't work, but cons does. So in the case of cons, um, all we've established is that this is this is definitely a cons, and we've generated holes for the two arguments. So at that point, we um, 
So we've, we've, we've made a bit of progress. We've come up with two sub problems. We're now going to solve those two sub problems. So for this first argument, A1, uh, we've, we've worked out its type. That's one thing we achieved as, as part of the um, uh, unification step. X has type A. So there is a local variable that solves this problem. So we can move on. Uh, for A2, uh, sadly, there isn't a local variable that solves this problem. So none of these things unify. So we'll try the constructors. So the type of nil is a vector of zero things. We can't unify zero with k plus m. Like we, we could if k and m happen to be zero, but k and m here, they are uh, local variables. I mean, I've, I've elided them here, but these are local variables. And um, so they could, they, they could be anything. So we can't unify zero. Similarly, we can't unify um, successor with k plus m for the same reason, because k and m might happen to be zero. It, unification has to find a solution for all instantiations of the variables. It can't be just any old one. So neither of those work. We have to resort to the recursive call. So we make the recursive call. Um, again, that gives us two sub problems. We know what's on the left hand side. So we know when we're solving the sub problems that we need to have something that is descending. We can solve those problems in the same way. So uh, looking through lo for local variables. So for this last one, A4, um, we have a local variable that fits. So we fill it in. We're done. So that's, that's the being the machine uh, part of this process. So essentially, what I've done there is I've implemented the machine to be me, but you know, still understand what the machine is doing, you'll understand that there's there's no magic there. It literally is following those four steps. Uh, that's, a, that's a literal literally too, not a figurative literally. That is how it's implemented. Um, so um, how am I doing for time? Uh, not great, but I've got, I've got one more thing, <clears throat> one more thing to mention and one more example to give. Um, the thing to say about scaling that up to, to whole programs and not just expressions is well, I've showed you expression search using unification. We also have case splitting. So we've got these primitives, add definition, case split. And all we do, I've, I've quoted the word just here because um, I sort of, I feel like internally it's a bit more, I feel like it should be a bit more complicated than that. But at the same time, to understand what's going on, is really all that's happening is we generate a definition. We try expression search on the whole. If it doesn't work, we try splitting the arguments left to right in turn. Uh, we only split to a depth of one. Um, and that's a fairly arbitrary choice, but it, it, it cuts down the search space and it works really uh, quite a lot. So that's all we have to do to extend this to, to program search. Uh, and the, the, final, the final step in this is, is about the ordering. Um, so what I've shown you, the, the, the algorithm I've shown you so far, that will find the empty list for our, for our rep function. What we actually want to do is, is think about what to do if we're not satisfied with the result. Um, so there's two reasons why we might not be satisfied with the result. One is if it didn't type check, in which case we reject it immediately. And the other is if we look at the result and you say, oh, that's not what I want. So all of this happens inside a uh, search monad. There's always a monad, isn't there? Um, and the search monad gives us the next result and a function to run if we didn't like the result, so a continuation of the search. So a user can always ask for the next result. And what we do in practice is we generate up front uh, a list of the first, uh, the first 16 results, which I've just arbitrarily picked because it seems to work. But I guess that's tunable. And then we sort those by the most local variables used in the definition, where used just means it appears on the right-hand side. So the rationale for this is if, we have a, if a function has an argument, we were probably intending to use it. And um, so Lena Augustin suggested this to me. Um, and I thought, oh, that's too simple. Surely that can't work. And it did. It worked really well. So he did this in his uh, gin, gin system. Uh, for Haskell. So you're, so what you're seeing now, uh, the, the examples I've shown you um, so far are implementing exactly this. Now, there is a small refinement, which I think I have a, 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 a bit of time to tell you about, which is about um, intermediate definitions. And, and I'm going to I'll do that by, um, by example. So this, <clears throat> this uh, example, this is my new favorite uh, introductory uh, dependent type example, by the way. Um, for, for the, the reason it's my favorite is that it's not vectors. 
Uh, and the other reason it's my favorite is that um, uh, it, 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 it's reasonably comprehensible. So, so run length encoding is, is um, so from old paint programs in the 1980s, and it dates back to um, transmitting television signals. Um, so encoding of, of, of things where you have a lot of repetition. So a run length encoding of a list, this is a, a compressed version of a list where the empty encoding is just the encoding of the empty list. And then I, I'm making no attempt to make this um, efficient. I, I'm just worried about soundness here. So if we have n copies of x and then an encoding of the rest of the list, then that gives us um, n repetitions of x followed by the rest of the list. So we can write a compression function for this. I won't go into the compression function. I do actually need to, I do need to generate rep. Um, but to generate uh, uncompression, so uh, we want to get our list back, uh, which happens to be this list x's, um, just to show you a, a new thing about Idris 2. Um, the thing, the list we need to generate uh, is supposed to be x's, but we can't actually use x's. This zero means that x's is, is compile time only. So we do, we do have to do a little bit of work. Uh, I'm going to try generating a definition for that. And it's not really what I wanted, because um, it's, it's decided just to put x, there's a single x on the front of the list. That search algorithm I showed you, it doesn't know about uh, repetitions. And even if it did, how would it know to pick it? Because it if it knows about rep, it probably knows about lots of other things. So this suggests I need to give a little bit more help. And what I haven't done in this type is say, like the, the list I'm returning is, is any old list. What I really need to do, so I've got this singleton type here, this, uh, let's call this the, the value singleton type, just so that I can say, um, you know, it, it, it's, um, you, you give it a list and then this will give back of the list you made earlier. So it's 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 a compile time guarantee that the list that comes out will be the input list, but we didn't have the we, we don't have that list at runtime, so we have to rebuild it. So I'll try generating that now directly because I have to deconstruct it. So a small refinement is to say um, if making the recursive call doesn't succeed, then um, see if you can case split on the recursive on the result of the recursive call. Um, that actually works for um, some other some other interesting examples. So this is this is my favorite one. This is the the continuation monad. Uh, if your eyes glaze over at this point, uh, don't worry. So have mine. Um, uh, I this this was actually set as a challenge by by Leonard after he told me about that heuristic. He said, "Can can your system do the continuation monad?" Um, so um, I'm not going to say what it is. I'm just going to generate the definition. Uh, so, so happily it can. Uh, it has to do a little bit of deconstruction of intermediate results. And uh, here's a, uh, a call with current continuation. This is something out of scheme. And again, if you don't know what uh, if you don't know what this is supposed to do in Has in Haskell or Idris, uh, again, don't worry. Neither do I. Uh, but fortunately, you can follow the types and you, you get the definition. And I would, there's no way I'd have been able to write this myself. I, I have no idea how this works. The, the only reason I'm confident this is the right answer is I've looked at the Haskell implementation and it's pretty much the same. So I, I thought it was pretty neat that, um, that it could do this kind of plumbing, that, that this additional step of, of refining by the intermediate definitions allows us to do that kind of plumbing. So remember, this is what it's about. It's not about uh, writing your uh, precise type up front and getting a complete definition and not having to worry about it. I'm not personally convinced that that's a good way to write programs in general. It's not a good way to do software engineering. It's occasionally handy, um, uh, but uh, when, when, like when you know that something is purely structural. But I really want to see the results and I want to understand them. I want to understand what my program's doing. If, I've, if I'm saying I'm going to write the spec and generate the program, Personally, I feel that all I've done is move the problem from programming, writing the program to writing the type. I think both parts of this, programming and the type, are part of your overall uh, process of programming. They are, they, they're they both useful notations we have. Sometimes one will be more useful. Sometimes the other will be more useful. I think our programming tools, our languages, and the tools we use to interact with those languages need to support um, both of these facilities equally. So that's the way I'm approaching program synthesis here, is giving us the ability, the ability to do these, these little bits of plumbing and to help us out, whereas we're still writing the programs ourselves. Um, okay, so I'd um, 
just to finish off, um, so I've shown you the Idris way. Um, the Idris way, there's, there's nothing there's nothing really new about this. There's nothing different from what other people are doing. It's just kind of my my spin on it and and um, how I've implemented and how I'm going to use it. So there's 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 plenty of things written about this that I, I'd encourage you to go and explore, and I'd also encourage me to go and explore uh, in order to make what we have um, uh, better. Um, so so a lot of this you know, inspired by the Gin tool and, and and what Agda can do, but also more recent work. Actually, these uh, I, I had so many papers I could pick from here, so I just picked a couple of representative ones. Um, so if you have a bit more of a fancy type system, and even if you have maybe some examples to go along with your type, that that increases the possibility. Or, or it, 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 there are ways of reducing the search space, so increasing the possibilities of what you can do with program synthesis. I think it's really time to take this this idea. Um, probably seriously, just in terms of programming um, user experience. Programming language user experience, or as a plux, as we, we like to call it. I, I want to I get people using that, that, uh, that, that acronym, just because I like the sound of it. Uh, right, to finish there, um, if you've got the right primitives, so if you've set up your language to be a type-driven, interactive language with, with these primitives for constructing programs, uh, program search turns out to be, I've used that phrase, surprisingly simple again. I think it's surprisingly simple. Um, these, are, these things are all relative. You may not agree. Um, you can always use things more effectively if you know how they work. Be the machine. Understand its strengths and limitations. And just to think of a couple of ways we might explore this, thinking about, um, so these, this, this synthesis is, is fairly general purpose. And sometimes we might be working in, in a particular domain. So one of the strengths of functional programming is in domain specific language uh, implementation, language implementation. So it might be that in your particular language, there are some fragments of the search space that are more worth exploring than others. One example I'm thinking of at the minute is a library for session types. So this is for communication protocols, where you might say, you don't necessarily, the machine doesn't necessarily know when you want to do steps in a protocol, like you might be doing other things first. But at some point, you're going to say, it's time to do some communication now. So just press a button and get the next action. Be, I don't know, I, I don't know what the interaction with the machine looks like. I think it should be there. And also, I, I have to mention machine learning, because if I don't, somebody else will. Could it help? Maybe it could help. I don't know what the source of programs is. Maybe, maybe when you're interacting with the system, um, Clippy pops up and says, um, usually in this situation, people try case splitting, or usually in this situation, people apply such and such a function. I don't know if that would be useful or annoying uh, or both, but it's, it's, it's a direction that's well worth exploring. Um, anyway, that's all I have to say about program synthesis. Uh, I see I have almost no time left, but I, I will be hanging around if people want to chat afterwards. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you for coming along. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Excellent talk. We have time for one question. So if anyone would like to raise a hand and, and join us here on the stage, please do so. OK, we have Manuel. Hi. Hi. I really like to uh, do all the stuff that you're doing there, but I don't even know which editor I have to install and how to configure it so that I get all these interactive <laughs> things there. Because nothing works. Atom VS Code, I don't know. Oh, really? Um... Um... Right, so this is uh, this is something that we probably need to resolve <laughs> quite soon. Um, th this is part of the change from Idris One to Idris Two is that they're adding a few things and re-implementing the protocol. Um, it should work with Emacs. It should work with with Vim and Atom as well. But there may actually have been some changes in the last week or so that have broken things that we just need to sort out. Um, so yeah, I think all I can say is sorry about that. We're on the case. Um, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I'm right. using Vim here, and, and I, I'm using my, my hand hacked Vim mode. Um, but there is there is a Vim mode that uh, that should work if if you're a if you're a Vim Vim user. But um, yeah, this is this is this is the the research quality software stage. I mean, we never really got out of that stage. Um, but it, it's it is at least in principle supposed to work in Emacs, Vim, Atom, VS Code. Uh, if it doesn't work, it may be that, that, that more people need to get their hands dirty and uh, start poking around. But don't worry, we're on the case. <laughs>